Welcome to this webinar with Preservation Virginia. My name is Leah Lane. I'm the curator of collections, and we are so very glad to have all of y'all there. So we're actually going to explore some of the most interesting objects from our historic sites. And it will just be a peek, and I hope it will just entice your appetite so that when things are safe to come back, uh, that you will, and that you'll be able to see some of these objects in person. And it's actually kind of a neat opportunity because these things are typically scattered across our sites and uh, they're never really together in the same room. So at least we can kind of have them virtually together. With that being said, let's dive on in. What makes an object worth preserving? Is it the people who held it? The material it was made from? The craftsmanship? The collection of Preservation Virginia reflects all of those impulses, from an early emphasis on objects associated with notable figures in American history, to the pursuit of period furnishings to complement our historic properties, to an appreciation of the many lives who intersected with those spaces over hundreds of years of Virginia history. The objects we will look at today are treasures, perhaps not in our typical way of thinking of this term, looking at you, Indiana Jones and Nicolas Cage. Rather, they are a treasury of stories, material record worth lingering over for a moment or longer, just to hear what they have to say. Our historic sites are each filled with hundreds of objects. We're just cracking open a door a tiny bit today. I look forward to the day when you can swing that door wide open and welcome you inside. It will be a joy to share all the treasures within. Let's start where so much of the American story began, at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, near the site where the first English settlers landed more than 400 years ago. They landed here because it's a geographically critical point, and the important situation of this stretch in sand didn't diminish, not by the dawn of the United States, and not even today. It's the perfect place for a lighthouse, or even two. The two Cape Henry lighthouses, old and new, are both beloved by visitors to Virginia Beach. The old lighthouse is open under the care of Preservation Virginia. It was the first of its kind approved by the newly formed United States, and it guided sailors for almost a hundred years before its light was extinguished in favor of the new tower nearby. On September 9, 1909, the United States Lighthouse Service placed an order from the Chelsea Clock Company of Massachusetts. It needed a new marine mechanical clock for Cape Henry, then just shy of 30 years old. Lighthouses are a hard place for objects to live. The salty air, the storms, the high humidity and heat all contrive to shorten the lifespan of most materials. As such, this marine mechanical clock was designed to be a survivor. Housed in a heavy brass case, the more delicate mechanical elements were protected from the immediate threat of its environment. We know from the sales record books kept by the Chelsea Clock Company that the Cape Henry clock originally had a nickel finish and the dial would have been silver with black lettering. All of the surface treatment has worn away. As the old Cape Henry lighthouse was no longer in operation by the time the clock was produced, this timepiece was almost certainly installed in the 1881, quote, new lighthouse, which still shines today. Thanks to our thoughtful donor, the clock is now back at the mouth of the Chesapeake, just a few hundred feet from its original home. Jamestown, about 50 miles up the James River from Cape Henry, has long been a treasured property of Preservation Virginia. In advance of the 400th anniversary of the landing of English ships, we were a vocal advocate for an exposition or a World's Fair to mark the occasion. As such, our collection is rich in materials related to the Jamestown Centennial Exposition, which was held in 1907 in Norfolk, Virginia. One of my favorites is the silver medal by Tiffany and Company, versions of which were presented to prize winners among the various exhibitors, but also to fair leadership. Our medal was presented to J. Taylor Ellison, Lieutenant Governor and former Mayor of Richmond, for his work as the Director of History, Education, and Social Economy Installations at the Exposition. 
Wilson wasn't alone in this effort, and such a medal could have just as easily been given to his wife, Laura Effie Hotchkiss Ellison, an early president of the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, or APVA, which was the previous name of Preservation Virginia. She was active in promoting Jamestown as a significant site of American history. Millions of artifacts have been uncovered from the original fort site, with excavations ongoing. I encourage you to check out the work of Preservation Virginia's Jamestown Rediscovery Project to learn more about their treasures. Arthur Allen made his journey to Virginia from England roughly 43 years after the establishment of Jamestown. He became one of the most prosperous planters in the region, and around 1665, he chose to have a substantial brick house built that reflected this status, a structure now known as Bacon's Castle. Today, it is the oldest surviving brick dwelling in North America. The first Arthur Allen didn't get to enjoy his home for very long. He died in 1669 at about age 61. His son, Arthur Allen II, we usually call him Major Allen, inherited the estate. Less than 10 years later, Surrey County became swept into what became known as Bacon's Rebellion. This conflict stemmed from violence between European and Native Americans in the Tidewater and became a civil war between those loyal to Governor Sir William Berkeley and a recently arrived agitator, Nathaniel Bacon. Major Allen's fellow Surrey County justices voted to send supplies to the rebellious Nathaniel Bacon. Allen disagreed and quickly left town to join Berkeley. Bacon's supporters seized the brick house and they thoroughly enjoyed all of Allen's creature comforts. He later sued the rebels for the value of 25,000 pounds of tobacco as compensation for the cattle, linens, ceramic, and lots and lots of wine that they consumed or absconded with. This massive loss may be attested to by the archeological record, including these wine bottle seals, marked with the double A for Arthur Allen. Seals became extremely popular in the second half of the 17th century and were applied near the end of the bottle making process by pressing a personalized stamp into a disc of hot glass. This was a status symbol. Most wine bottles were ceramic and unadorned. Those made with personalized seals cost one and a half times as much as a normal glass bottle. The wine seals were discovered during excavations of Allen's formal garden which Bacon's rebellion appears to have disrupted. In a deposit only two and a half inches deep, archeologists recovered pieces of 41 wine bottles, a whopping 85 pounds of animal bones, and ceramics, all dating to the period of the rebellion. The largest and most complex objects in our collection are the buildings themselves. While this is outside the scope of this lecture, it's worth noting the ways individuals have made their mark on historic structures like Bacon's Castle. For example, it's not uncommon to find engraved text on old windows, a name, a date, a doodle of a ship. This is a personal favorite from the Thomas Everard House in Williamsburg. These could be made using a diamond or other hard, sharp stone. The practice of writing on glass was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries that diamond pens were marketed for this precise use. It's still a tedious thing to do, and these engraved designs tend to be modest in scale. Not so with this pane of glass at Bacon's Castle. In 1838, Dr. Robert Emmett Robinson engraved it with a lengthy declaration of love to his wife, Indiana Allen Henley Robinson. It begins, Thou art a little tablet on which to inscribe a record of human happiness, and yet these words may be found here even after both of us have been laid in the dust, so uncertain is everything connected with human life. We recently discovered a description of Bacon's Castle that was printed in the Baltimore Sun in 1906, and thanks to this, we know where the poetic glass came from. It was originally in this window, which looks over the front of the castle grounds from a room that was historically used as one of the main bedchambers. Although only this pane of glass survives, we know from the newspaper account that there was at least one other love letter on glass from Dr. Robinson to Indy from New Year's Day, 1841. I especially like his little signature at the bottom with their initials within the words forever united. 
Sadly, Indiana died later the same year. Indy was the last descendant of Arthur Allen to call the castle home. In the same year that Dr. Robert Emmett Robinson engraved his words of love into the window, 1838, this one cent coin was minted in Philadelphia. In ensuing years, it passed from hand to hand until it's found its way to Bacon's castle. It's been there ever since, we just didn't know. This coin was recovered from the hearth of the 1830s enslaved quarters during the fall 2019 restoration work on the two-story, four-room structure, the only one still surviving at Bacon's castle. Sometimes objects like coins are deposited intentionally, and I have to hope this one was, but it could have easily slipped from a pocket and circled its way into a secreted crevice only to be disturbed by our modern preservation efforts. However it got into this hearth, this Liberty Head coin was likely the property of a member of Bacon's Castle's enslaved community at a time when they themselves were considered property by the nation that minted this currency, a moment where liberty was still far off. Dr. Robinson held dozens of individuals in bondage. The 1840 census lists 62 enslaved people, including one woman who was over the age of 100. 29 of these 62 individuals were under the age of 10. The experience of enslaved African Americans is central to the story of a place like Bacon's Castle and all the preservation Virginia sites. They were the people who handled the treasures of the household in their work. They helped preserve these objects that we're able to study and learn from today. Just nine miles northwest of Bacon's Castle is Smith's Fort, which is named for the unfinished defensive earthworks built by John Smith and other Jamestown settlers as a strategic retreat in 1609. Around 1761, a brick manor was constructed for Jacob Falcon, a successful Virginia tobacco planter, merchant, and a clerk of court for Surrey County. While none of the contents of Smith's Fort are original to the house, there are notable examples of Virginia craftsmanship. Perhaps chief among these are the set of chairs attributed to the shop of Fredericksburg cabinet maker, which is a term we use for furniture maker, Thomas Miller. Miller, who was born in 1748, was an immigrant from Scotland who operated a shop on Caroline Street in Fredericksburg from the 1760s through 1802. These two delicately carved cherry side chairs were originally part of a set of at least 12 owned by John Waller, clerk of Spotsylvania County. We believe that the fashionable set was commissioned not long after Waller's 1774 marriage to Judith Page. Their craftsmanship must have been appreciated by many generations, as other surviving chairs from this group are now in the collections of Colonial Williamsburg and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. If you continued northwest for about an hour and a half, you'll find yourself in the countryside of Hanover County, the location of Patrick Henry's home, Scotchtown which he occupied from about 1771 to 1778 during the early days of the American Revolution. This little box once held one of the most precious of household luxuries, tea. It's appropriately known as a tea caddy and is quite small. It's from about 1780 to 1800 and is English, which isn't surprising. Fine goods like these were imported extensively from the mother country. The entire outer surface is covered in complex marquetry. This process uses thinly sawn pieces of veneer, cut from exotic woods known for the vibrant pattern of their grain, and many were actually dyed bright colors like blues and greens. Inside the box, the surface is coated with a silvery layer of foil. This object has lived a hard life. Changes in temperature and humidity, apparel Virginians know well, takes a toll on the thin decorative layer of wood glued to the exterior. Through the resulting expansion and contraction of the wood, the glue eventually gives way, causing the tiny pieces to fall away or curl at their edges. As it was moved and jostled over the subsequent centuries, these losses increased. Family tradition holds that this little tea caddy once belonged to Sarah Winston Sim Henry, the mother of Patrick Henry. Sarah died in 1784, and this tea caddy is dated right to the end of her life. It must have been an immensely fashionable presence on the table. 
Sarah Henry would have watched her son's dramatic rise to the forefront of the revolutionary landscape, how he shocked and moved his fellow Virginians with a call for liberty or death, probably with some trepidation at the dangers stoked by his passionate oratory. Her tea caddy passed through the family, kept perhaps as a memento of her, a connection to her son, or perhaps just a convenient and beautiful place to stash those precious leaves. Sarah's tea caddy, while luxurious, is a known quantity. There were thousands made along nearly identical lines. This curious table, on the other hand, has fascinated curators for decades. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything remarkable about it. It's a relatively plain tripod table with a turned pedestal, single drawer, and rectangular top. It's what lies under this top, however, that makes this ordinary object extraordinary. Four paddles or arms are tucked under the top. They can be easily extended and have middle joints held in place by a pin, which allows the arm to be twice as long as their hiding space would have otherwise allowed. These appendages spread out in an awkward way. It makes one a little nervous to brush against them, and they aren't particularly strong. While slides on tea tables are relatively common ways to extend the surface area of a table, these arms are much longer and less stable. They would be a dangerous spot to place a drink or even a candle. What on earth were these meant to hold? We speculate that these might have been intended to support something quite light, perhaps even a multi-sheet map. The table came to Scotchtown in the 1970s with a very extensive family history of having been purchased from Patrick Henry's estate auction held at Red Hill in 1799. The ancestors of the owner had lived quite close to Red Hill, near the present town of Brookneal, and we do know that the two families intermarried and they show up in court records together. We may never be able to know for certain whether Patrick Henry spread his maps out over these odd little arms, but it's worth noting the importance of maps and map making to the Henry family. Patrick's father, John Henry, was a surveyor for Hanover County. In 1770, he published a new map of Virginia. It was a commercial flop, as it left out important details like roads, but it hung in some powerful places, including over the dining room mantle of the governor's palace in Williamsburg. Land surveying continued to be part of Scotchtown's post-Patrick Henry history. In 1817, a 28-year-old John Dudley George Brown, or as he typically went by, J.D.G. Brown, surveyed his father's property in Hanover County, right next door to Scotchtown, then owned by the John M. Shepherd family. In October 1820, Brown, who must have been building a growing surveying clientele, created this plat of Scotchtown. Perhaps he wanted an excuse to spend more time with one of its residents, Harriet Isabella Shepherd, who he married at the storied home in 1824. Plats sometimes show a symbol for the location of the main house on the property, but J.D.G. Brown took these thumbnails to the next level. He seems to have relished the chance to record little watercolor vignettes of the homes, making an otherwise straightforward legal document into something beautiful. At the heart of this plat is a little watercolor of Scotchtown. Brown also created a separate standalone portrait of the house. This is an amazing document. It's the earliest depiction of Scotchtown we have, giving us our best glimpse at what it might have looked like when Henry called it home. Of all the preservation Virginia properties, the John Marshall House in Richmond has by far the largest number of objects original to the structure and the family. Generations of descendants have generously donated these back to the home of their illustrious ancestor, who's over 34 years as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court transformed the role of the judiciary in America. The great thing about the John Marshall House collection is its depth. It's not just the flashy or the highly important items that were saved, although they certainly were. Rather, we have survivors like his spectacles or Marshall's shaving kit, complete with nubs of soap. The collection also reveals a great deal about the lives of the Marshall women, including Mary Ambler Marshall, his beloved wife. It's no secret that John Marshall was deeply, deeply devoted to Mary who he affectionately called My Dearest Polly. The two met at a ball in Yorktown, Virginia during the American Revolution, and their courtship lasted for more than two years. 
In an 1824 letter, Marshall recalled their love story, especially the lock of hair. This lock of hair. According to family tradition, Marshall's first attempt at a proposal was very politely demurred by Mary. With nothing left to hold him in Richmond, Marshall left the city. Mary was horrified. Her cousin, John Ambler, quietly snipped a lock of her hair and then chased after the rejected suitor. With the hair as a symbol of her true affections, Marshall returned to Richmond and repeated his proposal, which was accepted. Mary's hair was woven together with a lock of John's hair then tucked inside this gold locket, which is engraved M-A-M. Mary wore it for the rest of her life, and it is said that after her death in 1831, Marshall did the same. In that same 1824 letter I mentioned a minute ago, Marshall reflected on Mary's constant presence in his life. All the thousand indescribable but deeply affecting instances of your affection or coldness, which constituted for a time the happiness or misery of my life, and will always be recollected with a degree of interest which can never be lost while recollection remains. As museum professionals, it's really not our place to choose one object above all the others. They are all treasures in their own way. But put in terms of significance to American history, there is one treasure at Preservation Virginia that stands above the rest, the judicial robes of Chief Justice John Marshall. At first blush, they look like any other set of robes, familiar from the Supreme Court to Judge Judy. But that's the point. The iconic image of an American justice is centered on the stark black, almost entirely unadorned covering that they wear. John Marshall is the man behind that robe, and this is his only surviving robe. When the American judicial system began, justices decked themselves out in a range of styles, mostly modeled on the English court system with which they were most familiar. These were often colorful with stripes and topped with elaborate wigs. It was a visual assertion of, th of authority, and it makes sense for judges in this new nation to follow a protocol that was already working. In fact, this is the robe of our first Chief Justice, John Jay, which adheres to the existing style. John Marshall was known for his plain style of dressing. It wasn't that he was dour. On the contrary, his humorous and affectionate personality is well documented. He's an easy guy to like. Rather, his simple trappings perhaps indicate an attention to relationships and intellectual life rather than the latest style. Or maybe he just liked black. Whatever his motivations, when John Marshall took the oath of office in 1801, he donned a plain black robe. The other Supreme Court justices followed his precedent. This object shouldn't survive. It's inherently fragile, and it's one of only two that have survived from the 34 years of Marshall's leadership of the court, the other one being the one I showed you that was used by John Jay, which is in the collection of the National Museum of American History. Marshall's robe is made from extremely thin silk that was blackened by a dye that contained iron. Over the centuries, it's essentially rusted. None of this was held by the normal wear and tear of use. Conservators have noted residue from sweat, which has further weakened the textile. You could imagine Marshall sitting in an unclimate controlled courthouse, melting under his yards of silk fabric. The very fact that we treasure this robe has not always worked in its favor. Yes, it was saved, but it's been on view for much of the last 108 years, since Emily Harvey placed it on loan to the John Marshall House in 1912. It's traveled to exhibitions, including shows at the Supreme Court and Smithsonian. Right now, it's taking a much needed rest. Safe inside an archival box, Marshall's robe will soon be placed in the capable hands of Howard Sutcliffe, a conservator whose previous projects have included ancient Egyptian textiles and Kermit the Frog. Careful measurements will be taken and exact replicas made. The original robe will live in an advanced storage and display case, protected from light and handling as much as possible. This national treasure, with a little help from friends, is going to endure. It's the enduring quality of the martial robe that made it resonate with our current Chief Justice, John Roberts, who wrote, History credits John Marshall for adopting the black robe, worn by every member of the court for more than 200 years. The judicial robe symbolizes our nation's long tradition of having an independent judiciary based on the rule of law. 
As former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor observed, it's all about the common responsibility that these black robes symbolize, that they're all engaged in upholding the Constitution. Whenever I open the box and I see the worn silk of Marshall's robe, I'm comforted by the continuity of these ideals. Tattered, but still enduring. I can picture him, sweat rolling down his face, listening to oral arguments and shaping the course of American history. Some of our treasures tell sweeping stories of national figures. Some of them are glimpses on the lives of ordinary people. I learn more about them every single day. Right now, I can't welcome you into the historic structures that these objects call home, but I do look forward to the day when I can. We'll see you then. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. All right, so now we have reached the question and answer portion of our time together today. And thank you so much for all of your questions and your comments. Um, it's a really, so this is a new way of us chatting and getting to know you guys, and I'm just really thankful for you being here. Um, so one of the questions we got was, uh, does Preservation Virginia ever loan to other institutions? And we certainly do. We're really happy to share our treasures. Um, other institutions share with us. Uh, it's part of what we do as, as a good museum. And um, so if you know of a project going on at a museum that maybe we could help with, just let us know, touch base. Um, and someone else asked, uh, where would those wine bottles have been made? They would have probably been made in England. Um, the American glassmaking industry took a while to really get going. As with a lot of imported goods, England, they, they really had it kind of down pat. And so it was hard for us to get things to um, a level where it made sense to buy local. Um, it was just more expensive to make it here. So they were probably made in England. Uh, I also got a great question about how we are gonna share these objects in the post COVID-19 world. Uh, and that's absolutely something that we are thinking very hard about. Uh, our first priority is always going to be the safety of our staff and our visitors and also our objects. Uh, so we're, we're having a lot of fun thinking of creative ways to make that happen. Um, but one of the ways that we are certainly committed to doing more of is this digital platform. It's, it's a great way to reach a ton more people and um, bring objects together that otherwise wouldn't be kind of in the same space. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, I've got a couple people ask me what my favorite object is. So I, I just started in December. So it's been kind of like Christmas every time I go to our sites and I get to see what amazing objects have been collected. Preservation Virginia has been around since 1889 and for a lot of that time we've been collecting. And, um, and with various purposes, as I mentioned. Um, and so you get some oddballs in there and some things that I'm sure when they were collected, they were just intended to be you know, a bed cover for the bed, but it actually ends up being something really important. Um, for example, there's something called a bed rug. It's a very, very rare uh, type of textile. Uh, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts has a great article. If you go on their website and go to their, um, their journal, uh, you can learn more about bed rugs, but they were one of the most common bed coverings. They're a lot thicker. They're almost, it's almost tufted coming out of the top. I, I wish I, I could explain it better. Actually, I have, I, I saw somebody ask, and so I went ahead and pulled up a photo of it. So this is, this is our bed rug. It's a really unusual design. It's from Loudoun County, Virginia, and I'm still working out the genealogy, but I think we might be able to get back to who made this rug. And that's part of the fun of this. I like objects that there's a little bit of a mystery to them and we're still figuring them out. Um, as, as some of you guys know, I also really love John Marshall's soapbox. I think it's just absolutely hilarious that we have soap that is accessioned into our collection. It doesn't look like I put that on here, but um, definitely worth seeing. <laughs> um, let's see here. That looks to be all of the questions that I see so far. Let me make sure there's nothing else. Oh, I see. <laughs> Why do we call it Bacon's Castle? It's, yeah, 
Absolutely. It, it really should be Arthur Allen's brick house. And that's kind of how it was known initially. But at this point, since the 18th century, it's been called Bacon's Castle. And so for clarity and continuity, we've stuck with the Bacon side. Um, it's, it, it is a really interesting part of its history, to be sure. Let's see. Someone has asked about preserving John Marshall's robe. So I, I walked you guys through uh, a lot of the challenges that we're facing with this robe. And it's something that we take really seriously. And there actually is a campaign going on right now. It's called Save the Robe, um, savetherobe.com. Um, and if you go and you search that, uh, you will find more information about the robe, about the conservation that we have planned for it, and if you feel like you want to contribute towards it, we would really appreciate the help. Uh, this is truly a national treasure, and we feel a great deal of responsibility to care for it properly. So, yeah, definitely encourage that. Let's see. Oh, interesting. There's a comment about the table, the one that had the arms that folded out. Um, maybe it could be used for working on textiles. Absolutely. That, I mean, anything that was light and large could have been used in that way. And that's, that's another great thing about objects. I mean, we think about them as having one particular use, but really it changes over time. Um, corner cupboards may have originally been used to hold ceramics, but maybe somebody put their TV in them later on. You know, it's, it's, it's all about the generation using it. Uh, so could that table have been used to put a quilt on? Totally. Absolutely. Uh, I have a question about how we track all the objects. We are really fortunate. Um, we use a great database um, called Rediscovery. And uh, it's really simple to use. Um, of all the ones that I've worked with, and I've worked with them a lot. Uh, it's quite straightforward and it creates a little entry for each of our objects. So each object is assigned a number and that corresponds to a data entry point. You can put photos in there, you can put articles. It's, it's really a, a pretty robust system. Uh, so I can definitely recommend that. Uh, but it, it helps us track because, I mean, there's, there's thousands of objects and they're spread over all of these sites. And there's no way one person could, could keep all that in their brain. So it's good accountability. Uh, I have a question also about how we're going to use the funds from Giving Tuesday. That is not something that I, I really know, but I know that one of the reasons I wanted to come work for Preservation Virginia is how diverse our mission is. You know, I, I work with the stuff um, and, and that's what I really love. But I have colleagues whose passion is public outreach and advocacy and saving some of our endangered sites. And so, I love that there are so many different ways that, that those funds can be used. And I'm sure that they will be used in a way that will be really beneficial to Virginia and to preserving our historic sites and structures and communities. All right. Well, I think that is all of the questions that I see. Um, if anyone has any other questions that they, that they want to have answered, uh, this is my email address. So my email is lane at preservationvirginia, all spelled out, dot org. And I really am happy to talk to you more about the things you've seen or the things that you want to see. And we hope that we see you too. Um, it's really, this is fun to talk to you this way, but seeing you in person will be all the, all the more fun. Um, so anyway, take care, stay safe, and we hope to see you next week when our webinar will be focusing on Bacon's Castle. It'll be myself and uh, Jen Perswinder, who did our uh, previous webinar on John Marshall, and Eric Litchford, who is our architectural preservation specialist. And we are going to tag team uh, looking at the cultural, architectural, and curatorial sides of Bacon's Castle. It really should be a fun, a fun trip. Uh, so I hope to see you then, and until we meet again, take care. Bye.